deepest dives of the giant squid's natural predator, the sperm whale. Whales actually play a really important role in the oceanic biome, both in the upper zones where they live and breathe, and even in the lower zones, or the sea floor. There's a really awesome phenomenon that happens here called a whale fall. Now, when a whale, or some other large animal, dies, two things can happen to its body. Either the corpse stays at the surface, or it falls to the ocean floor, and when it falls to the ocean floor, that's the whale fall. When the corpse stays near the surface, buoyed up by the gases that are produced during decomposition, the whale's body is usually consumed pretty quickly. The vast bulk of marine species live near the surface, so if they see this giant, rotting whale body floating by, they all get a chance to feed off of it, they all get a chance to eat it, as do birds that can land on the body and peck at it, as well as other terrestrial animals that dwell near the coast and might swim out to chew on the whale carcass, or that might give the whale a try after its carcass has been beached on the shore. The high temperature and the exposure to oxygen will accelerate the molecular decomposition considerably, and so after a few days or weeks, the corpse is just stripped bone. There's no flesh left. Now, in the other circumstance, when the whale's body doesn't float, it'll sink. This will usually happen when the whale dies in colder, denser water, where the temperature slows decomposition, and the gases that are produced by this slow decomposition are just absorbed by the ambient water, instead of uh, being produced so quickly that they, just, that they just fill up the corpse. And so all of these factors combine to make the corpse sink. It falls to the ocean floor. As the whale carcass sinks, the cold temperatures will prevent it from decaying rapidly. Once the carcass finally lands on the ocean floor, it will become a place of interest for all manner of organisms, from scavengers to microbes. The carcass becomes like a temporary organic city, an isolated little micro-ecosystem, all built around this huge mass of organic material that's been dropped into an otherwise barren marine landscape. Because you have to keep in mind, unless you're talking about a coral reef, or some kind of coastal zone where you have a lot of vegetation that can reach the sunlight, when you're talking about the ocean floor, for the most part, it's just a sandy, barren expanse of nothing. So when you have a huge piece of organic matter the size of a whale literally drop down and just land in the middle of this wasteland, it becomes an oceanic oasis. The first thing that happens is that this giant corpse will be attacked by larger, mobile scavengers, like sharks and hagfish, if they come this deep. And they'll, they'll dig into the soft tissue, and they'll just rip out masses of flesh to eat. During this initial feeding phase, the whale carcass can lose more than 50 kilograms, or more than 100 pounds, a day. After some time of being violently ripped apart, the decomposition process enters a second stage. At this point, the bones of the whale carcass are exposed, and bits and pieces of its flesh are scattered all over the surrounding area, because, you know, these scavengers are pretty messy eaters. For more than a year, various scavengers and opportunists will feed off of the residual meat left on the bones, as well as the gristle and the gunk left behind by the larger carnivores. The mineral sediment on the ocean floor that's surrounding the carcass will be enriched by the organics that have been thrown around everywhere, and the organisms that live here can also feed off of that stuff, the, the dissolved detritus. And because you have all this animal activity, you'll also have a lot of uh, animal feces that might build up from all of the, the creatures that are coming by and having lunch at the Whale Carcass Cafe. All of this biomass saturates the nearby mineral sediment with nutrients, and it helps all of the, the little bacteria, and the worms, and the scavengers, and everything else that lives down here. This will eventually take us to the final stage, where there's really not much left of the whale carcass besides bones. Sulfophilic bacteria will migrate into the bone tissue, where they can then access and anaerobically digest the fat that's kept hidden in the bone marrow. This last stage, where the chemolithic bacteria eat away at the residual fats within the bone, can last for the better part of a century. 
Now, the takeaway point here, the, the takeaway point that I want you to get from this, is that the whale carcass takes quite a while to be fully digested, on the scale of multiple years. With around 700,000 whale falls, or whale carcasses, existing at any given time, these massive piles of organic material each represent a literal oasis of food and nutrients in an otherwise barren and desolate world. Naturally, the creatures of the deep bathypelagic and the abyssopelagic swarm to these dead whales and form tightly focused ecological communities around them. It's a very dense concentration of biological activity. In regions where whales are highly concentrated, like along a migration route or in a mating area, the, the rate of whales that are dying and the rate that their carcasses will fall and hit the ocean floor may be fast enough that all of these species of scavengers and opportunists can actually reproduce and their offspring will just travel to a new carcass for fresh dead meat. In this way, the bodies of the dead whales create nutrient nodes studding the ocean floor and the species of worm and crustacean and fish that feed on them can actually sustain a delicate ecosystem that perpetuates itself like a fungus or a bacterial culture, which has this really dynamic growth in the sense that it reaches out to a new food source and consumes that before moving on to a new food source. It's this kind of very dynamic, ephemeral, ever-changing, ever-present form of ecosystem. When they're still alive, the whales will tend to breathe and hang out in the epipelagic zone, up in the upper layers of the ocean. They will live mostly in the mesopelagic zone as they search for food, and every now and then they'll dive into the bathypelagic zone. But it's only when they die that their bodies will sometimes sink 4,000 meters down into the abyssopelagic, or the abyssal zone. The abyssal zone is truly the abyss. It's the deep if you want to hear the rest of this exciting episode, then head over to the Biologic Podcast channel. Become a subscriber, check out all of the other awesome biology content, and consider supporting the show through Patreon or the official store. And as always, thanks for listening.